thank you all very much. I hope you are now replete after an excellent lunch. Uh, lots of banter and uh, activity going on over the lunch period. So um, I'll introduce the panel to you more formally in a moment. Um, but as we mentioned by Richard, we're very proud to be joined by a world-class uh, group here today. Uh, in this session, we'll explore ways in which we can apply technology in healthcare, education, agriculture and business to deliver sustainable and substantial economic impact and GDP growth for our country. Um, as you all know, we're on the edge of a new communications era. Uh, the ultra-fast broadband project and rural broadband initiative are set to radically improve the speed and capacity of the broadband networks available to nearly 98% of New Zealanders. The Network for Learning initiative is delivering similar capacity to our country's future, our children in their schools. In 2012, a study by Bell Labs into the social and economic impacts of UFB and RBI showed that the economic activity generated from these projects would grow our GDP by $5.5 billion. Uh, but the study also showed that over 20 years, we'll save up to $33 billion within the economy from doing things more effectively and efficiently online. These estimated savings were approximately $6 billion in healthcare, $3 billion in education, $9 billion in agriculture, and $14 billion in the business sector. So huge potential for material impact in the areas affected and represented by our panel guests. So investing in the knowledge sector and growing New Zealand's capacity to use this data could position us as a global leader, attract international investment, and increase our export earnings. So tangibly, how do we harness and leverage all of these great opportunities to ensure New Zealand develops as a productive and confident country on the global stage? To provide us some insight on these topics, we have a panel of talented, passionate New Zealanders who can talk with authority about the importance of technology in supporting our growth. So let's meet our world-class panel. First up, we have Dr. Claudia Weiss. Uh, Claudia is recognized as one of New Zealand's foremost and leading health sector experts. She has over 20 years' experience in the health industry, an MBA from Harvard, has worked for McKinsey as a medical doctor, a hospital manager, and expert advisor to governments, hospitals, biopharma, and ICT companies. She is the CEO of Health Vision New Zealand and has spent much of her career working in the Asia-Pacific region, the US, and Europe. Claudia's professional passion is applying technologies to support transformational change in healthcare, and she's led major technology projects across the globe. This has is, this is included coining the phrase for future first healthcare. Hello, the patient will see you now rather than the doctor. Claudia, thank you for making your time to join thank us you. today. Secondly, we have Professor Pari Keha. Um, Professor Keha wears many hats at AIT University. He is Pro Vice Chancellor for Maori Advancement and also for Learning and Teaching. He is Dean of the Te Ara Potama, the Faculty of Māori Development, and former Pro Vice Chancellor for Commercialisation. He also has a strong and extensive background in the governance of public and private companies, was honoured by the Queen in 2008 and awarded a QSO for his services to business, education and Māori. It's safe to say that Professor Carr knows education, as well as being highly educated, he's also an expert on what could inspire learning, and one of his great passions is looking into how we use technology as a vehicle to transform the learning process. In fact, he's AOT's chief cheerleader of mobile and digital learning, and in this self-appointed role, he is committed that by 2015, AOT will have an internationally recognized learning and teaching digital model. Professor Kaha, welcome to the panel. Next up is Dr. Hayden Lawrence, a tech-savvy dairy farmer from Taranaki. Uh, with a PhD in precision agriculture. I didn't know there was such a thing. Um, <laughs> Hayden is famous in the farming world for a few things. Initially for designing the technology and revolutionary rapid pasture meter, a sophisticated device using laser to read grass height, linking it to GPS, and effectively telling farmers how many hours of grazing they have left in their paddocks. This has increased farmers' payout by up 4.6 cents for every percentage increase in grass utilization. Also now being exported. Also as an equity partner, on a challenging dairy farm, he's delivered amazing results. Production figures 69% ahead of the New Zealand average. So the superstar result achieved through the effective integration of technology and farming practices. Farmers are besieged by technology offers, and Hayden's a specialist at figuring out how to use those effectively. An avid tweeter, um, he uses apps to link his farm workers to tasks, records, record livestock, and so on. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hayden Lawrence. And finally, we have our very own Tim Miles. Tim is a highly experienced New Zealand business leader with an outstanding track record across the ICT and telecommunications industries, both in New Zealand and internationally. As you heard previously today, he's held senior roles at IBM Unisys, 
Vodafone and PGG Wrightsons and has operated in New Zealand, the UK and elsewhere. Um, Tim firmly believes that Genai is well placed to assist more and more New Zealand businesses into an exciting ICT future. He understands the challenges and is convinced of telecom's importance in contributing to the overall success of our country. Well, Thank you, Tim. Simon, I'm, I'm really hoping that you guys are going to be more listening to these three. Because one thing you've got clear is I'm the dumbest guy up here, right? So we've got a professor, two of other PhDs, and I've got a BA in history and geography. So <laughs> you, know, you know who you need to be listening to. Thank you, Tim. So, You're welcome, Simon. to no, the panel. <laughs> So I'll pose a question to the entire panel, but ask them to each answer it in turn. So um, you could say a successful business needs a competitive, a competitive advantage. A successful country is no different. How do we build a technology-based, sustainable, competitive advantage for New Zealand? And Claudia, perhaps I could start with you. Put me on the hot seat first. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, I can't talk for economics overall. That's not my area of expertise, but I can probably talk a little bit about healthcare. The issue that we've got going forward, as every nation does going forward, is that of a extraordinarily huge tidal wave of ageing population that all of us are going to face and struggle with. Our current spending on healthcare is projected to grow substantially as a result. Now, that's going to put us into a massive, massive predicament. And that predicament is not just going to face you in this room, it's going to face the generations subsequently who are going to be paying for it probably with the debt that gets created if we don't sort it out. Now, what we see in New Zealand is we've got some incredible ICT firms, absolutely leading thinking players who are pushing the boundaries on what we can do in healthcare and how we can tackle how we deliver healthcare. Because really to solve this problem, we're not going to get rid of old people. But what we'd have to do is be smart in how we work with our old people. And so being smart and how we work with our old people can be enabled through technology. And what we should be doing from my perspective um, with ICT is nurturing these companies so that they can really help solve the problems that need to be solved. Too often we put in too many barriers. The barriers are egos, politics, funding, all sorts of stuff. Everyone wants to fight together for the small slice of the pie. Let's Forget about it being a small slice of the pie and recognise it as a huge slice of the pie. If we can win that pie in New Zealand and prove the concept here, we can win that pie internationally and everyone needs a solution. Fantastic. Thank you. Perry. Imagine, imagine if we made a decision to deliver our curriculum as we do Wikipedia. What would that mean? Well, in the context of a university with, say, some 20,000 equivalent full-time students who on average pay about $1,000 a year in textbooks, that's equivalent to $20 million a year that our students would purchase in textbooks or $60 million worth of textbooks over the life of an average bachelor's degree. Imagine if we gave them all that material. Imagine if we provided a single pipe with a single resource for every teacher in New Zealand to have available to them world-class best practice curriculum at no cost and certainly at little effort. What would that do for those rural communities in particular that cannot afford to have a biology teacher, a mathematics teacher, an economics teacher? Our preoccupation with the cost of things fails to effectively create an environment in which you understand the ecosystem between the creation of a sustainable competitive advantage and indeed technology. Because one of the things that we have to understand is that amongst other things, extraordinarily smart people, which are required to create extraordinarily smart products, are on worldwide short supply. I have the extraordinary privilege of working in a university where I get to meet extraordinary young people. But in order for us to build a sustainable competitive advantage built upon technology, we require extraordinarily smart people. In the absence of an ecosystem, which includes our education system, but more importantly, like-minded people, it is not unreasonable to expect that those extraordinarily smart people are in worldwide short supply will go elsewhere. Particularly when, in the wisdom or lack thereof, this government has made a decision to effectively make loans and allowances unavailable for postgraduate students. 
we should be concerned about this. We're worried about the cost of those loans and allowances, but more importantly, we fail to understand the value to New Zealand of, amongst other things, allowing our students to go overseas. And some might say this is a good thing. Of course it's a good thing if we can ensure that our young people can come back, but in the absence of an ecosystem which includes not only like-minded people, but access to capital, access to the technology which will support their extraordinary ideas. Just as the hormones are raging, <laughs> our young people leave. And the problem with hormones as they rage, often as not, is they will find a partner overseas. Fortunately, at least in one instance, we've been able to acquire one. <laughs> <laughs> and increasingly, the term sustainable comparative advantage in technology are not as easily paired as they used to be. Because last week we saw Nokia receiving a, its cheque for the sale of its telephony business to Microsoft. Even behemoths as large as Nokia can come or go. I make a plea for ensuring that we have smart people in New Zealand, which are part of an ecosystem supported by smart technology. Thank you, Perry, for that insight. Hayden, as we turn to you and to look at the agricultural sector. Thank you. Um, my response comes from a little bit of what I saw actually on the news last night. Um, we had a group of students uh, go overseas and win a gold medal in the VEX robotic competition, um, which, is, which is great stuff. Now, their tutor came on um, after they'd done a small interview and said that New Zealand has the potential to move away from an ag-based economy to a high-value tech-based economy. As a dairy farmer, <laughs> I, uh, it makes your ears stand up, and to him I say absolute bollocks. Um, <laughs> in order for New Zealand to build a sustainable technology-based economy, we need to stop making these two industries compete against each other. We actually need to integrate them because there are a number of synergies that, that both um, enterprises can learn from. For example, I could guarantee you if I took some of those students that Putty was just talking about um, onto my farm and just have them, have them for a day, they could, if they were mechatronics engineers or program developers, they could come up with solutions for not only my business, but dairy farming in New Zealand and worldwide that could have major, major economic potential. But I see the key is getting them and, and I look at agriculture, it's low-hanging fruit in New Zealand, and uh, we, we have the ability to uh, really improve the way we're using technology in that industry. Um, so we shouldn't be dismissing agriculture, um, and it, we should be saying, OK, well, let's, let's get some of these tech-based solutions and, and really imp improve our productivity on farm. And that would be the way I would see we could improve our sustainable competitive advantage in a tech-based economy. Thank you very much. Tim, to you. Well, first of all, I'm a son of a dairy farmer. I confirm he is one. He's got calluses on his hands, and mine have long since turned to mush. Um, but I'm representing, I guess, all the other parts of society. Um, but I, I, I will acknowledge healthcare, education, agriculture as being just hugely important, I think, to the, to the success of our country. So as somebody who's been very privileged to live and work overseas on a number of occasions, one thing that you pr pretty quickly learn is that the best thing about New Zealand is it's a long way from the rest of the world. And the worst thing about New Zealand is it's a long way from the rest of the world. And we're a country of a bit over four million people and we make our living primarily by trading. Yes, we do some trading in a domestic market, but we do a lot of trading also internationally. A and I think the whole, the whole technology the question about technology enablement is absolutely vital for New Zealand having a very successful society, providing opportunities for people to live here, to work here, to enjoy the benefits of living in this wonderful country, but equally being able to play a part either in the New Zealand economy, no matter where they live, rural or urban, or actually being able to play a part in the global economy. And if I could just make this sort of provocation there's a lot of focus I read in the media all around, we don't have this, we don't have that. You know, we don't have broadband in, in some part of New Zealand or it's not fast enough, and there's a lot of that. And it is true that in, those enablers need to be there. But the other issue we have, and the opportunity, 
that isn't talked about so much is even where we do have that capability, I think there's a real opportunity for New Zealanders to step up and make a greater use of the technology. The technology in of itself doesn't do anything. It's what we, the businesses in New Zealand and the people of New Zealand do with it, that's what actually creates the value. So we've got to have the capability and then we've got to have the appetite and the skill to actually utilise this. Thank you, Tim. Well, some fascinating insights there and um, I guess some slightly converging themes that maybe you might try and explore. I mean, it sounds like there are a number of areas. There's a lot of very smart people doing some amazing things. The infrastructure is there, but it's how do we take the content and deliver it? How do we create the ecosystems that are required? I mean, you, you talked there, Hayden, about bringing agriculture and tech together and so on. So I'd be interested in your thoughts around if many of the component parts are there, what do we need to do to bring together those ecosystems to look at some of the funding issues, to share the IP across sectors, and to leverage the infrastructure that is already in place? Do you have any, any views on that? Oh, uh, Stephen, um, I, I think one of the major issues uh, we've got in, in agriculture and probably other industries as well, and we've heard a lot about it today, is around data. And we have the ability to record a lot of data. However, we need to ensure that we, we're able to use it. Um, agriculture is probably, was probably a little bit behind the times in terms of we were developing solutions and then looking for a problem. Now, rather than having a problem and developing a solution to fit it. And so we have to be very careful going, um, going forward that the data that we're collecting from all this technology that we are creating, that we are actually able to use it to increase our productivity. I see that as one of the major um, things going forward that, that both tech and, and other industries need to, need to understand and to, and to help with. And if I could just interject, yeah. though, because I see that I completely agree with you. We need to be smart on how we use data, but that's also the big issue that seems to stop us from moving forward, especially in healthcare. It is just extraordinarily frustrating in many instances where um, the discussion around data and what we're going to do with the data and how we're going to use the data and the the many different forms that that's presented at, it stops us from actually progressing together to, to resolve problems. So. The data does need to be used and it needs to be used smartly and it needs to be used to solve actual problems and probably the best way to find out what those actual problems are is by talking to patients and talking to doctors and nurses and everyone else who's involved. Um, but the other side of it is let's not get bogged down with analysis paralysis and, and let's actually start sitting there going, well, we know there's going to be data risks. But let's mitigate those risks and make informed risks and decisions and mitigation strategies so that we can get move past this barrier of actually doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And once we move past that barrier, that's when we can see big shifts into um, delivering healthcare in much more localised communities or in people's own homes. And the NHS has estimated that 40% of consultations for um, medical consultations could happen uh, away from the medical practice. Now that's incredible. 40%. If you look at the economic impact, not only for the doctors, but on your time, imagine if you had to sit there and for a 10 minute consultation had to take an entire morning off work, and I'm sure some of you have probably been in this room, I have, and we've all done that. That's half of your day gone. You sit there, you see a doctor for 10, five minutes, and then you go back onto your merry way. A lot of that time could be resolved if we sat there and went, look, we recognise it's not going to be perfect, but our consumers are actually willing to take that risk more than maybe some of the, um, the government side, because the funder side, because they're a bit, you know, understandably concerned because of the political consequences, media consequences and things like that. But we have to sit there and work as a team together rather than against each other to resolve this. And that includes the media too. Yes. Our preoccupation um, with precision, particularly precision with data, is counterintuitive to effectively the benefits that technology can provide to and for us. And if we're looking at ways forward, I would suggest that one of the things that we could do in this room is agree that amongst other things, that the person sitting either to the left of us or to the right of us are not our competition. They're our new best friends. But more importantly, um, as Hayden's already pointed out, getting closer to those who are capable of exercising judgment, those who have the experience, 
um, is extraordinarily important because in the institutions for which I have worked in universities are characteristic of one thing, we're awash with data, huge amounts of data, but extraordinary information poor. And often as not, information combined, uh, combined with um, judgment, if not experience, can produce outcomes far in excess of the simple application of technological tools. So for those of you in here who have an affection for data, if not a pornographic affection for data, can I suggest that one of the things that we could do and agree on this afternoon is that working closer with business in much more um, simpler um, ways in engaging with practitioners will effectively lead to much stronger outcomes, whether it be in education, health, or indeed agriculture. I would have to um, commend Hayden for um, his mixed metaphors, because I've never been part of a panel which managed, managed to include both bollocks and low-hanging fruit um, <laughs> amongst the conversation. So I just leave that with you, because I thought... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> this <laughs> is <Yes. laughs> oh. oh, fascinating. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. And then some of those messages very much align. And Geraldine McBride earlier was talking about um, data and bringing it much down to live data and her new, uh, new expression of little data rather than big data. So, how do you give the patients, give the businesses, give the students? control of or access to what they require rather than us sort of trying to defend it and corral it and say it's, it's ours to, to, to issue. Um, another question I pose to you is... Well, is well, I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry, Tony. Right out of time. Wait. Wait. Why, I want to pick up on something Patty said. Why are we so preoccupied with the cost of this? You know, if you start listening to the benefits, what's, what would be the... What's the annual produ production in New Zealand? How many litres are produced of milk? I've got a number in my head, I'm well, not sure if I'm right. You're looking at the average per care of around 320 kgs of milk solids, okay. so per care. So if, so if we applied the technology you've used on your farm, if we got yep. some similar level of productivity off, off, off a number of other, you know, of a range of properties, dairy farms in New Zealand, what order of magnitude? 500. What, it'd be 500 million. Within three years. It'd be 500 million. And, you know, in education. No, no, five, 500 kgs. 500 kgs. Kg. So what's that in, in money that, that people here can understand? We'll multiply by that by the number of cows in New Zealand by... Uh, well, by, 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 by... By six, by six, by six million six, odd, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. By, so, by seven or eight bucks. Right, there you go. So it's a bloody big number. Yeah. Health care. <laughs> it is a big number. And he health care, how much, so, you know, how, how much money... Well, what Claudia's talking about, what would that save? And the education of people. I, I know within the telecom group, you know, we, as part of some work we've been doing, we've been involved in a, in a, in a low decile education community in Auckland. And what effectively we've done is we've taken the internet out of the school and put it into the homes of, of these folk that, that can't afford it. And we've done it, you know, we've done it as a, I guess as a, as a part of our community service. But the results are unbelievable. The, the truancy has dropped from, you know, very high to almost non-existent. And the first lot of pass rates have come through from these kids, and I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but these are the orders of magnitude. The pass rates have gone from about 25% to 83 because these kids are now engaged in education, and they want to come to school. But if I could, if I could interject, because yeah. what you guys did there is unbelievable, and we should be seeing this everywhere, including in healthcare. But what the, the problem is, the, if you're asking about what's stopping us around this cost, the issue is where does the funding come from? So if we're looking at a healthcare IT system, um, we, there are so many different layers where that spend needs to come from, and we're talking millions if not billions of dollars in a sector that's already super stretched. But where you do see successes and show quick results is when you have those from the ground up pilots where people just go, I am pissed off, let's get together, let's sort this problem out, and they get around the, the table and they sort it out and it's a small investment that then quite quickly proves itself. The, the, the challenge we've got is we, we, we've got this tension between going mega grand scale, which costs so much money and scares the bejesus out of everyone because they've got limited budgets, and whatever you put on capital spend you, can't, you have to take out of operating spend, and then you're making a decision, what, we can't do those surgeries because we want to spend on IT. It's, there's a real moral issue when it comes to healthcare, and, and the IT spend is a long-term spend, short-term gain, really. Two years, you'll see big differences. Tim, let me, let me give you an example in a university context. Imagine 
if we gave all of our students their curriculum. Now, I still have two large potato sacks of these things that we used to call lecture notes, in which for, on average, 50 minutes each lecture, we simply copied down material. Imagine if we gave all of our students that material. I'm old and consequently have a right to be old-fashioned, but good learning and better learning is a product of social engagement. That doesn't always have to happen in expensive rooms. If each of us was to go home tonight and take a piece of chalk and draw a line down the middle of our apartments or houses, very expensive, particularly here in Auckland, and say that we're only going to live in half of it, we would not do it. But we have billions of dollars tied up in property and education, whether it be universities, high schools or secondary schools, um, in which we only teach from them for 26 weeks a year. That is equivalent to only choosing to live in our homes, uh, half of our homes a day. We wouldn't do it. So imagine if we gave all of our students their material, particularly in a university context, and imagine we take an institution in which its students are economically irrational and they get given a chance for the first time to choose whether or not they could do a three-year degree in two. Now, at my institution, I'm regarded as being the university's chief technology terrorist because I terrorise people by saying these things. It is terrorising, if not terrifying, to your average academic who has only ever taught for 26 weeks a year to have to think about teaching for a little bit longer. <laughs> but more importantly, if our students were not economically rational and we offered students an opportunity to complete a degree sooner rather than later, if simply 6,000 of them chose to do so and the jobs were available, 6,000 times an average starting salary of $40,000, equivalent to $240 million worth of added GDP, by simply doing the right thing and giving our students the opportunity for the first time to consume more than 120 points per year. Fantastic. I would suggest that each of us, particularly those of you that have got children, if given the choice, and at the moment you don't even have the choice, you would do it. There is something though around the solution space that is around partnerships focused. You guys have the smarts and a huge amount of money. Um, we pretend to be smart and have very little money. <laughs> and so there's got to be there's got to be a way where if you bring all the right parties together to solve the problem, that's how we can solve it. And we need to think through really creative funding solutions. It can't be the big wham bam, one big buck, you know, ten million spent in one go. That's just not right. going to work for most healthcare companies. We need. I, I agree. I think partnership is absolutely the, you know, a huge part of how we move forward. I wasn't meaning to suggest before you fund all of this out of the existing healthcare budget. I know that's not possible. Really, my, my question really was, if the gains are so compelling in education, healthcare, and frankly in agriculture, because this is, this is part of the answer of creating the wealth to fund the, 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 this, this side. What you know? What's what's stopping society uh, saying? Look, we do want more money applied to these things because th these aren't you know these aren't small gains we're talking about. They're not small prizes. These are things that would be, I think, critical to the future of New Zealand society. Obviously, big gains. Yes, the substantial money required, but you know this isn't. I wouldn't say this is a high risk bet, and I've and. I think plenty of administrations make a lot of bets that are a lot more risky than this. But that's public sector. For, for, the, for the private sector, for, our, for ourselves, we don't have any excuses. But yet a lot of New Zealand businesses, some embrace this technology. And you, know, you all know the, the stories of the folk that are doing brilliantly in utilising technology or, frankly, making a business out of technology. But still, um, you know, there's an amazing number of organisations in New Zealand who haven't even got a website, which is, as we heard from Geraldine McBride today, um, that's old hat and you don't bother with that. It's all about social media. So the good news is if you're one of those, you've missed that bit, we can go straight to social media. <laughs> well, panel, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to call time out on this very lively discussion. We actually needed a couple of hours, not uh, half an hour. So thank you all very, very much for your contribution. Absolutely fascinating. And it sounds like we need to step out, find a piece of chalk, release our, our textbooks to the world. And uh, this room needs to, there will be a collection at the door for everybody to contribute to Hayden CDEX uh, device so that we can lift the economy through agricultural growth. Thank you all very much. And to our panel, thank you Get out. again. Get out. Get out.